She can be found everywhere, from posters to t-shirts to coffee mugs, clad in blue overalls, hair wrapped in red and white bandana, glaring determinedly as she rolls up her sleeve, flexes her bicep, and declares, we can do it. Since her introduction during the Second World War, the figure of Rosie the Riveter has become a feminist icon, a potent symbol not only of the thousands of women who flooded into munitions factories and other non-traditional jobs in support of the war effort, but of the limitless capabilities of all women. But how did this 80-year-old propaganda character become the iconic figure we know and love today? Was Rosie the Riveter ever an actual person, or just the product of some artist's imagination, no more real than the scowling, finger-pointing figure? of Uncle Sam. Well, as with everything, the answer is complicated, but also fascinating. The entry of the United States into World War II in December 1941 saw the induction of over three million men into the U.S. armed forces, severely depleting the ranks of industrial workers needed to produce tanks, ships, aircraft, and other war material. To make up for this shortfall, the United States government turned, as it had during the First World War, to a huge, largely untapped pool of labor women. The impact of this policy on the American economy was staggering. In 1940, women made up 13% of the labor force. By 1945, this figure had risen to nearly 37%. The combination of military mobilization and the entry of some 2 million women into the economy also accomplished what nearly a decade of Depression-era New Deal social programs could not, dropping unemployment from 6% to nearly zero. However, contrary to our popular image of the war, most working women were not employed in factory production. Rather, the vast majority worked in clerical or secretarial roles, the war granting them new opportunities to advance to better paid positions. Some 100,000 also served with the American Red Cross as nurses, while 350,000 joined the American Women's Volunteer Services, a vast organization that provided dozens of services, including motor transport, canteens and childcare for industrial workers, legal advice, telephone switchboard operators, and the selling of war bonds and stamps. But more than 300,000 women did take up war production jobs recently vacated by men serving overseas. For instance, 50,000 served in the Women's Land Army as agricultural laborers, 100,000 in military auxiliary divisions like the Women's Army Corps or WACs and the Navy Women's Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service or WAVES, while nearly 1,000 female pilots formed the Women's Auxiliary Service Pilots or WASPs, who trained combat pilots, test flew newly manufactured aircraft, and ferried them from factories to overseas military bases. But the most famous wartime female workers were the 85,000 members of the Women Ordnance Department, or WOWs, who were engaged in the production of aircraft, tanks, rifles, artillery shells, and other weapons. Initially, however, many women were reluctant to leave domestic life and join the workforce, so government propaganda departments set about finding suitable role models to drive recruitment. And one of the first such mascots and the template for Rosie the Riveter was not an American, but a Canadian. Like the rest of the British Commonwealth, Canada had been at war since September 1939 and had thus gotten a head start in war production and the mass employment of women. One of the largest armament manufacturers in the country was John Inglis & Company, which was contracted by the Canadian government to manufacture some 40,000 Bren-like machine guns. The bulk of production took place at the company's plants on Stratton Avenue in Toronto, and it is here in 1941 that photographers from the National Film Board discovered 19-year-old Veronica Foster, one of 14,000 women working on the Bren gun production line. Taken by her youthful beauty, the NFB decided to make Foster the face of Canadian war production, photographing her working at the Inglis plant and in more casual settings like playing baseball or swing dancing. The most famous of all these images shows Foster in her work coveralls and bandana, lounging in front of a completed Bren gun while coolly smoking a cigarette, even though Foster herself did not smoke and only lit up for this one photograph. Known across the country as Ronnie the Bren Gun Girl, Foster appeared on recruitment posters and in magazines, newsreels, and propaganda films. The campaign proved extraordinarily effective, for by war's end, nearly 800,000 Canadian women were employed in munitions work. After the war, Foster left Inglis and embarked on a successful musical career as lead singer of the popular dance band Mart Kenny and his Western Gentlemen. However, the famous American image of the female munitions worker rolling up her sleeve and proclaiming we Can Do It would not appear until 1943. Designed by artist J. Howard Miller, the poster was part of a series produced by the Westinghouse Electric Corporation to display in its factories. Yet despite its now iconic status, the poster is not quite what it appears to be. For one thing, it was designed not to recruit women into the workforce, but rather to boost morale and promote productivity among Westinghouse employees. Indeed, the image was only displayed on Westinghouse shop floors for two weeks, from February the 15th to the 28th, 1943, before being being replaced by other posters in the series. Thus, far from being a popular and beloved wartime image, the poster was only ever seen by a handful of workers before disappearing.
disappearing into total obscurity. It only resurfaced in the 1980s when Reagan-era budget cuts forced the U.S. National Archives to dig through its collections for images to license. The newly rediscovered poster was printed on millions of postcards, coffee mugs, t-shirts, and other memorabilia, quickly becoming a beloved piece of World War II iconography and a powerful feminist symbol. Further complicating the myth, at the time of its printing, the We Can Do It poster was in no way connected with the name Rosie the Riveter. That that particular moniker would not enter American pop culture until Miller's image had already come and gone in the form of a song written by Red Evans and John Jacobs. Recorded by multiple artists, including the Four Vagabonds and swing band leader Kay Kaiser, Rosie the Riveter became a nationwide hit, its lyrics extolling the skill and work ethic of the ideal female munitions worker, stating, All the day long, whether rain or shine, she's part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory. Rosie the Riveter. On May the 29th, 1943, another iconic wartime image appeared on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post, painted by legendary illustrator Norman Rockwell. Modeled on Michelangelo's painting of the prophet Isaiah on the Sistine Chapel ceiling, the cover depicts a powerfully built female riveter confidently munching on a sandwich, her rivet gun cradled in her lap, and her overalls covered in patriotic symbols including a V for Victory button, Blue Star Mother's pin, and an Army Navy E-Service Production Award pin. And just in case that was a little too subtle, the woman sits in front of a giant American flag while her boot stomps on a copy of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. In another clever detail, the women's lunch pail is labeled Rosie, a direct reference to the then popular song. The song and the image soon became inextricably linked and an American icon was born. But was there ever a real Rosie, a flesh and blood munitions worker who directly inspired the popular character? Well, maybe. According to Red Evans and John Jacobs, the title of their popular song was chosen for its alliterative appeal and not based on any particular person. The model for Norman Rockwell's magazine cover, however, is known. It's 19-year-old Mary Louise Doyle, a neighbor of Rockwell's who worked as a telephone switchboard operator, not a riveter. Amusingly, Rockwell painted his Rosie with a heavier physique than his model and later phoned Doyle to apologize for making you into a sort of giant. The model for J. Howard Miller's We Can Do It poster, however, remains the subject of considerable debate, and over the years, several women have come forward claiming to be the inspiration for the iconic image. For many years, the original Rosie was thought to be Rose Will Monroe, who worked at the Ford Motor Company's Willow Run aircraft plant in Ypsilanti, Michigan. In 1942, Monroe was discovered by actor Walter Pidgeon during a tour of the factory and was hired to appear in a short film selling war bonds. However, as the Miller poster was created before the name Rosie the Riveter had entered the American lexicon, the connection to Rose Monroe is an unlikely coincidence and was probably made long after the fact. Another popular candidate was another Michigan woman, Geraldine Hoff Doyle, who worked in a Navy machine shop. In the 1980s, Doyle saw a photograph of a bandana-wearing machinist leaning over a lathe and recognized her younger self. The image bore such a striking resemblance to the Miller poster that by the 1990s, Doyle was widely cited in the media as the inspiration for the image, the claim even appearing in her 2010 obituary. However, other than a strong resemblance, Doyle had no solid proof of the connection. Furthermore, she only worked in war production for two weeks, quitting for fear that a sharp accident would end her career as an amateur cellist. It was not until shortly after Doyle's death that scholar James J. Kimball identified a more likely candidate, 20-year-old Naomi Naomi Parker, a machinist at the Naval Air Station in Alameda, California. After five years of searching through various archives, Kimball unearthed a copy of the photograph long thought to be of Geraldine Doyle, but whose original label bore the rather questionable caption, Pretty Naomi Parker is as easy to look at as overtime pay on the week's check. And she's a good example of an old contention that glamour is what goes into the clothes and not on the clothes. Pre-war fashion frills are only a discord in wartime clothing for women. Naomi wears heavy shoes, black suit, and a turban to keep her hair out of harm's way. We mean the machine you dope. Yet despite this discovery, there is still no firm evidence that Miller, who died in 1985, used Parker's image as inspiration for his poster. Nonetheless, by the time of her death in January 2018, at the age of 96, Naomi Parker had largely displaced Geraldine Doyle in the media as the original Rosie the Riveter. Whatever the case, the image of Rosie the Riveter has far outlasted and outgrown her original inspiration and purpose, becoming an enduring symbol of the American home front and the key role women 
played during the Second World War. However, it is an image which conceals an uncomfortable truth. But as soon as the conflict ended, the massive wartime propaganda machine switched gears from convincing women to join the workforce to convincing them to leave it. Despite women's vital contributions to the war effort, their involvement was seen as a temporary wartime expedient by many employers who pressured their female employees to return to domestic life and return their jobs to the men returning home from the front. Those who chose to stay were often demoted, subjected to severe pay cuts, or dismissed outright, with many employers claiming that production processes had changed so rapidly radically that female workers were no longer qualified. Almost overnight, the number of women in the industrial economy fell to near pre-war levels, while the post-war zeitgeist re-emphasized their social role as wives and mothers. But the memory and spirit of Rosie the Riveter never fully went away, and after 80 years of her sister's contributions not being officially recognized, in 2019 an act was signed collectively awarding the Congressional Gold Medal to all women who worked in armaments production during the Second World War. But the true legacy of Rosie the Riveter is in how she and her sisters forever changed the nature of the workplace and women's role within it. Whether driving a tractor on a farm, ferrying a bomber aircraft overseas, or welding together a tank, the women workers of the Second World War proved once and for all that whatever a man could do, they could do just as well. And there was no turning back.